It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce our speaker for this morning. Natalie Turner is a research associate for the Area Health Education Center of Eastern Washington at Washington State University in Spokane. She received her undergrad degree in psychology from the University of Washington and her graduate degree in clinical psychology from Eastern Washington University. She is also a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Washington. Areas of specialization include mental health, K-12 education, family violence, and complex trauma. Current projects include responsibilities as an evaluator for the Washington State Readiness to Learn program and a trainer for issues related to complex trauma throughout Washington State. Today she's going to talk to us about impact of complex trauma. Let us give Natalie Turner a warm welcome. Well, thank you and good morning. Wow, there's a lot of people here. All right. This is such an exciting opportunity for me because this issue of impact of trauma on children is something that I'm extremely passionate about. So when I was asked by Children's Administration to come and speak at the Ed Summits, I was very, very excited. And um, I'm hoping that I'm going to give all of you in the room today a little bit of an orientation to the issues that kids who are living in complex traumatic environments are facing. Um, a better understanding of what that looks like to all of you and things that you can do to make a difference on a day-to-day -day basis with these kids. Um, we're going to start and we're going to talk about the description that's on the screen right now. Hopefully everybody's had a chance to look at it. Um, when we developed this training at WSU, we developed it as a day and a half long training series. And so in order to scale this down into a three hour presentation, what we've done is we've had to take some big chunks of information out and they're big chunks of information that I think are really, really important for folks to have. And so what I've done is I have sent a copy of the full day and a half training to Bruce. He has it electronically. Um, I have it. And so make sure if you haven't registered to please put your email address down and let us know if you want a copy of the full presentation because I think there's a lot of information in there that's going to be really beneficial and helpful for you all and I want to make sure that you get your hands on it even though we didn't get to cover it today. So that said, um, what we're going to be talking about is the impact of trauma on all children at all ages at all stages of development. And so what I wanted to start with was a description of a kiddo, this particular young man is in middle school. And if you haven't read the description, I'd like you to read the description. And then what I'd like to do is just have you take a couple of minutes at your table to discuss initial thoughts, perceptions, concerns, or questions that you might have about what might be going on for John at this stage in the game for him. And then we're going to come back and, and talk about that. guys know a kid like John? Yeah. 
Based on this description, and, and part, of this, part of this is about really getting in touch with being honest and real about what our own perceptions and misconceptions of kids can be, no matter how hard we try to do the right thing and to, you know, look at things from a different perspective and try to be helpful and supportive. What do you think is a typical perception of John? Is there a brave soul that wants to say it? How do people perceive this kid? Yes. <laughs> As a parent. Okay. How else? How else do people might view this child? As a troublemaker. As a bully. Yes. He's in survival mode. Do you think it's going to be easy for John at school? or hard for John at school? Do you think if John has been pegged as having a short fuse and he's getting in trouble that um, people probably aren't going to give him the benefit of the doubt or maybe not so much? No, no, okay. I want you to just kind of keep this description of John in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to him a little bit later. But just remember that it's really easy for us to see a child and view them completely by their behavior and not always remember that there might be other things going on. And that's a lot about what we're going to talk about today. So, okay. So what are we going to do today? We're going to start by talking about what is trauma. I'm going to give you some basic definitions. I'm going to give you some stats. Um, part of what we're doing in creating this framework around complex trauma and the impact of complex trauma is trying to make sure that everybody has the same set of language that they're using when we talk about this as an issue. Because I think most of you, when you hear the word trauma, automatically have a set of definitions that come up for you in your own mind. But if we're not all singing off the same sheet of music, it makes it really hard for our systems, whether they're natural systems or professional systems, to communicate with each other and make sense of what it is that we're talking about. So we're going to give you that common framework. We're going to talk about some statistics. We're going to talk about the impact on families. What does this look like? Um, there are seven primary identified domains of impairment that we're going to look at in terms of how does trauma impact kids. And then we're going to talk a little bit about response. What are the things that we can all do on a daily basis to make a difference? Okay. But before we do that, I'm going to traumatize you all. Now, why would I want to do that? Um, we're going to talk briefly about secondary trauma and the impact that working with and being exposed to these children has on all of us as natural helpers, as professional helpers, as parents, as caregivers, as human beings. Because part of the reality is this is really hard work. And if you don't acknowledge that and you don't take steps to take care of yourself, you're not going to be the best helper that you can be in whatever capacity that is. And I think a lot of times what happens is we get very involved in doing the work that we're doing. We get very desensitized to the extent and the nature of the events and the exposure that these kids have. And a lot of times we kind of forget how ugly it really is. And so part of grounding back to why we're really here is to remind everybody in the room that regardless of your exposure to trauma um, in whatever setting that you're operating in, that these experiences are really horrible for these kids and that we typically only get to see this much of the picture. And so a child walks in to our world and we only know what he or she tells us or what the people that are working with that child tells us. And we don't get the whole story. And we don't know what happened the day before, the night before, the month before in that child's world that's impacting what we're seeing in that brief moment in time. So what I wanna do is I'm going to play a little audio clip for you. It's just about 30 seconds. Some of you may have heard it before. Um, some of you may not have. What this is is an actual recording of a 911 call of a young child who was witnessing domestic violence incident at home between his parents. This child was about five years old. 
I'm prefacing that because it's not pretty, and if there's anyone that's uncomfortable with it, this would be a good time to either plug your ears or, or get up and leave for a second. Um, but again, part of this is about resensitization to how big this issue really is um, and how we don't really know what's going on because most of us don't get involved at this stage in the game. So I'm going to go ahead and play the clip for you now and then we'll talk about it. Pretty ugly, isn't it? None of us know when we come into contact with a child if the child that we're coming into contact with had that experience the night before we engaged with them. We don't always know. Sometimes we know. Um, the folks in the room that are working for Children's Administration, our social workers, oftentimes know because you have connection with law enforcement you know the issues around a removal um, but for our teachers when a child walks into your classroom you don't know if this was their experience the night before so when they come into their classroom and they're acting out or they're withdrawn or they're disengaged a lot of times we make assumptions about why that might be happening but we don't always know and we're not the ones that are the first responders on the scene quite often. And so this was just an exercise to reground folks into the experience of a child in the moment and to keep that in the back of your mind as we continue to have this discussion. So as I already said, it's really important for all of us to make sure that we understand that experience and we understand that the experience of the kids that we come into contact with is going to affect us. We need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and we need to make sure that we're acknowledging that this work is hard and that it will affect us. And if there's anyone that could stand up and say that it wouldn't, then I would question what you were doing here because we're human and this is tough stuff. So please keep this in mind. When you're working with these kids, make sure that you have your own support systems to help support each other, your families, because you can't do this work without it. So what is trauma? Um, it's important that we distinguish between acute and complex trauma. Although symptoms may look the same, um, what we're really going to be focusing on is complex trauma today. So um, we use the definition of an exceptional experience in which powerful and dangerous events overwhelm a person's capacity to cope. This is trauma. Typically, we see symptoms that manifest themselves in terms of fear, horror, and helplessness. Um, in the little guys, oftentimes we see agitation and disorganization, and so we're not really sure what's going on. We know that something's not right, but we can't always put our finger on it. So when we talk about acute trauma, we're talking about a single event. This is a single overwhelming event, typically one time in nature. It's typically unexpected, and you don't know it's coming. Complex trauma, on the other hand, is the experience of multiple or chronic and prolonged developmentally adverse traumatic events, most often of a personal nature, with early life onset. These are the children that are growing up typically in caregiving systems with ongoing, persistent, chronic abuse and neglect. That's what we're really going to be talking about. That's pretty general. Um, but what you need to keep in mind is we're talking about a persistent pattern of events. Okay. So these are just some examples of the, the pathways of trauma exposure in children. We know that kids are experiencing a variety of different issues and they're getting hit at it from all different angles. But typically what we see are the big ones in terms of child maltreatment, um, physical and sexual abuse, physical, emotional neglect, substance abuse and mental health disorders in their caregiving system, 
um, witnessing intermittent partner violence. We do a lot of research at WSU around um, issues of intimate partner violence and how children exposed to domestic violence in the home are affected. And there's a lot of research in this area right now. Um, community and school and peer violence, it's important to remember that we're not just talking about violence in the home, we're talking about violence in the neighborhood, we're talking about violence in the school. All of these things have an impact on how a child is going to respond to their world. Um, and then accidents to the child and death of a parent or a caregiver. So what I want to do now is touch briefly on some statistics. We have stat after stat after stat that talks about the impact of trauma on our children. But what I wanted to do was just highlight a couple of things. And in the larger packet, we have a lot more statistics that we can share with you because there's a wide body of research that's been going on around this issue right now. But I think sometimes we really have a narrow focus and we don't think in terms of broader impact and how trauma actually does affect all of us in all of our situations. Um, it's really easy to, to restrict to certain populations, certain groups of kids. It's that, it's that perception that we have that isn't always accurate. Um, one large national study reported that 90% of respondents uh, stated that they had at least one lifetime traumatic event. And if you think about this, and if you think about your own experience and the people that you know that are close to you in your world, how many, of, how many of you have either experienced or know someone who's experienced something traumatic in their life? This is all of us. And it's really easy to forget that it's all of us and that those experiences shape how we come into every situation that we encounter. Reports of adverse events in childhood predict risk of lifetime physical health problems, mental health problems, health risk behaviors, and subsequent intimate partner victimization. And we're going to talk about the impact that this has on children as they grow up in a little bit. Other studies that use different definitions are coming up with the same statistics over and over again. Um, that two-thirds of American adults are reporting significant lifetime trauma exposure and that in any given year as many as one in five of us are exposed. Okay, I want to highlight this statistic for a second. Approximately one million children each year are officially substantiated as victims of child abuse and neglect in the United States. And on the face of it, that seems like a lot of kids. But the reason that I want to highlight this statistic is because this is grossly underreporting the number of kids who are actually maltreated in our country every year. And a million is a lot. Where this statistic came from, we're going to go, we're going to go backwards a couple of steps. So in a given year, there are approximately 5 million referrals that are made. These are calls that are made into CPS about questions of abuse or neglect that are happening. Of those five million calls, about two-thirds of them warrant some type of further investigation. And of those two-thirds, a million of them get substantiated. Why is this important? Because if you think about it, there's five million calls that are being made about concern for the safety of our kids in this country but how many people don't ever pick up the phone and call? How many people know that something's going on in their neighborhood or in their home or with a family member? Um, there's a lot of folks out there that aren't mandated reporters that don't call and they don't want to get involved. They have their own fear. So we are really limited by very narrow legal definitions of what constitutes child abuse and neglect in our state, in the country. And we're still coming up with these numbers that are really, really big. So when you think about impact on a much broader level, we are talking about millions and millions and millions of kids in our country that are being maltreated and are experiencing traumatic events in their life on a regular basis. And we don't know who they are because they haven't come in contact with the system yet. A little bit about violence in schools. On any given day, almost 60 million people participate in K-12 education. It's one of the reasons that we felt it was really important to get educators coming to these trainings because 
Where are our children going? They're going to school. When you look at these statistics, and as we continue to talk about the training, one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is that what the research is telling us is that only 25% of the children who are experiencing complex trauma in their life ever get their foot in the door and engage in some type of formal system. We're talking about child welfare, we're talking about mental health, we're talking about substance abuse. All of the things that we think about around formal professional helping systems to engage and support our kids who are experiencing complex trauma. 75% of the kids that have this stuff going on never reach a formal system. 75% of them. We don't have them identified. We don't know who they are. They don't have access to the supports that they need. But where are they going? They're all going to school. That's why it's really important to keep in mind what we can do in all of our other roles, particularly the roles of our educators who have these kiddos that are coming into their classroom and they're doing all sorts of stuff that makes it really hard for them to manage their, their classroom and their curriculum and get stuff taken care of. And they don't always know what's going on. You know, it's not your job to necessarily know what these kids are bringing in the door when they come and they sit in your classroom. But they're bringing a lot of stuff. And we don't know who these kids are. And if we don't know who they are, then we don't know how to support them. And that's what's really wonderful about creating this trauma-sensitive approach and perspective, because you don't have to know. You don't have to know a child's history to engage with them and create a relationship with them that can be really supportive and can help them be successful in school. It's also important to recognize the role of community violence. Um, because there's a lot of community violence happening and a lot of times folks think well we've created a really safe environment in our school or in our classroom and so we can support kids that way because they don't have a safe environment at home and so we've created this really wonderful welcoming safe environment for kids to be supported at school and that's really great but if your neighborhood isn't safe and you're not safe walking from your house to your school the chances of you actually getting there to reap the benefits of that safe environment are probably pretty small. And there are a lot of folks out there that are living in unsafe environments and kids don't have transportation and they don't have other options and they're afraid of what might happen to them between the time that they leave their front porch and the time they get to their classroom. And so they don't go, they stay home. And all of a sudden, those kids are at a disadvantage because one, they're not experiencing a safe environment, and two, they're not receiving the benefit of their education. Okay. A couple other things to point out. I think most of us are familiar with poverty as a risk factor, a risk factor to a whole bunch of things. Um, we know that over two-thirds of children that are born to mothers between the ages of 18 and 21 are living below 200% of the poverty level. So those kids coming right out of the gates are at a huge disadvantage. We also know that um, the suicide rate in this state is continuing to increase. Um, a lot of risk factors associated with that. And the number of child abuse accepted referrals continues to increase as well. Okay. So talk a little bit about impact as far as some of these numbers, because it's, you know, it's fine to say, OK, well, there's a lot of trauma happening. Well, what does that mean? Um, we know that victims of abuse are 12 times more likely to attempt suicide than non-victims. And we also know that children who witness domestic violence are six times more likely to commit suicide. So all of a sudden, we're creating these risk factors in kids. And again, all of this stuff is completely preventable. There are things that we can be doing now to reduce these impacts. In terms of school success, Maltreated children have three times the dropout rate of the general population. And I want to highlight that because in this state, we already have a 30% dropout rate. 30% of our kids in this state are not graduating from high school. So now let's talk about the kids who are living in complex trauma and what kind of chances for success they have. Not real great. Children who witness domestic violence are four times more likely to be arrested. This has huge implications into our court system. Was there anyone I didn't see, I don't know if it was asked, a show of hands, anyone that's from the court system, juvenile court, and we've got, I know we have some CASAs in the room. Okay. 
We know that in our state, the arrest rate is higher than the national average. It continues to go up. And what we know from the statistics is that we have a set of practices that we've put in place to re-adjudicate our offenders that come into the system. We also know that it's pretty ineffective and it's not working well because we know that these kids that are getting arrested and are entering into our court system are the ones that typically reoffend, And they're coming back and they're coming back and they're coming back. And we do what we can to support them and we see progress while they're in and then they come out and something happens and they come back in. So we need to be looking at what it is that we're doing because there's, there's a disconnect there. And there's a huge disconnect between what we're doing to support that child when they're involved in our system and what we're doing to support that child and their family and the traumatic environment that they're living in once they're released and we're continuing to see this pattern over and over. So we need to be thinking about doing something different. Okay. okay. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the impact into our health systems. Um, there's been a lot of research and some buzz going on lately about the role of trauma and the impact into our medical system and into adult health. So how many of you have heard, just show of hands, of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? Okay, a few of you, good. So the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study was done um, in collaboration with the CDC and the Kaiser Permanente Health Plan um, by a couple of doctors, um, Vincent Folletti and Robert Anda, and there's information on how to get more about the ACES study in your packet um, in the source list at the back of my presentation. But what they did was they did, it's, this is an ongoing now, so it's been about 12 years, ongoing retrospective longitudinal follow-up study on adults who were part of the Kaiser Permanente Health Plan in San Diego and the impact that childhood traumatic experiences had on their physical health now as adults. And so what they did was they've been following this, this cohort of folks now for 10 plus years and they're continuing to follow them. What they did was they went in and they took extensive patient medical histories. They created a trauma exposure questionnaire and they did a lot of interviewing with these folks as adults to find out what their current health state was and what their traumatic experiences were as children and started to create the link between the impact of trauma on a child and how that's affecting their adult health. Can you folks in the back see? I see some squinting. Do, do we need to pull the blinds down for you? Are you okay? Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind when we talk about these results, these are folks that were living in San Diego that had Kaiser Permanente insurance. So we are not talking about a huge issue around disproportionality, which is something that always comes into play when we have these discussions, is these are just the kids who are living in poverty, or these are just ethnic minority children. These are middle to upper middle class, suburban, educated, middle-aged folks who have jobs and have families and have health insurance. These are the people that we're talking about when we look at the analysis. And the reason that I emphasize that is because this is middle America. These folks did not, they weren't all um, born and raised in San Diego. They did come from diverse backgrounds. But this is, a, this is a middle class group of people that they were evaluating. So keep that in mind when you look at the results. Okay, this is the ACE pyramid. Basically what the pyramid describes is the theory that Anton Folletti came up with that adverse or traumatic experiences in childhood actually disrupt neurodevelopment. So they're changing pathways and structures of the brain which lead to social, emotional, and cognitive impairments, which lead to adoption of health risk behaviors, which lead to things like chronic health problems, um, and essentially, at the end of the continuum, premature mortality. So what did they measure? These are the, the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences that they looked at. So they looked at physical, emotional, and sexual abuse as a child. They looked at experience to physical or emotional neglect, um, a child witness to domestic violence, substance abuse in the home, uh, parent marital discord, so divorce or separation, mentally ill or suicidal household members, 
or crime in the home as evidenced by having a family member imprisoned. Okay. This slide gives you an idea of the impact of these experiences and how widespread they really are. What they found was that more than half of the population studied, and again, we're talking about over 17,000 people, over half of the population studied had experienced at least one adverse childhood event in their life. One in four had been exposed to two or more, and one in ten had actually experienced five or more of those events that I had just put up on the previous slide as a child. They also found that given exposure to one category, you had an 80% likelihood that you were going to be exposed to a second or a third or a fifth or a tenth. And as ACEs increase, so what they did was they basically counted up the number of experiences that you had and they assigned you a score. And what they found is as, as that score increased, so did the risk of health and social problems as an adult. What were some of those things? Heart disease, chronic lung disease, liver disease, suicide, injuries, HIV and AIDS. And there's a whole long list of all the other adverse health outcomes. What they did when they did their analysis is they looked at patient histories, they looked at family histories, they looked at genetic predisposition, so they were able to control for all of those things in their analysis. And what they found that stood out when they controlled for all those other variables was that it was the exposure to chronic and persistent negative events in childhood that was directly related to negative health outcomes as an adult. So persons who had experienced four or more categories of childhood exposure compared to those who had experienced with none had a four to twelve fold increased health risk for alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide attempt. Two to four fold increase in smoking, poor self-rated health, more than 50 sexual intercourse partners, and sexually transmitted disease, and about a one and a half fold increase in physical inactivity and severe obesity. So what does this mean in terms of financial cost? What this slide demonstrates is both the direct and indirect cost of not dealing with child maltreatment in our country on an annual basis. And I know the numbers are kind of small, but what it comes out to is about $94 billion a year is what we're investing in having to treat issues that are related to child maltreatment. It comes out to be about $258 million a day that we are investing on the back end to pay for and support kids who are victims of child maltreatment. Now, why is that important? Because it's completely preventable, for one. And for two, if you start to think about what you could do in terms of prevention and early intervention, if we had $258 million a day to invest in activities to support our kids and support our families to keep this from happening in the first place, just to highlight, this statistic is about six years old. It came out before the published results of the Everest Childhood Experiences Study. It came out before we started to look at impact of complex trauma into the education system. So these numbers are really, really low. So just think about that for a second. <clears throat> 